Welcome. This video is all about uh, solving second order linear ODEs with constant coefficients. And here I'm going to deal with the case of complex roots to the characteristic equation. So suppose we have a differential equation a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y equals zero, where a, b, and c are constants. Um, if we make the ansatz that y is equal to e to the rt, we get, after a few steps and plugging things in, we get <clears throat> an equation ar squared plus br plus c equals zero. And solving this, in general, if we don't know what a, b, and c are, we can always fall back on the quadratic formula. And that will give us that um, the roots are minus b plus or minus. Those are where the two different roots come from. The square root of b squared minus 4ac, all divided by 2a. And now in this, in this video, I'm going to focus on the case where b squared is less than 4ac, meaning that the sign of the number under the square root will be negative. And so I want to do a little rearranging first to make sure it's clear uh, how we can express that in simpler terms. So let's first just pull out a minus 1 from that square root. And so I get minus b plus or minus the square root of minus 1 multiplied by, and when I pull that square root of minus 1 out in front, I flip the order of things inside. A minus sign goes in front of the b squared and a plus in front of the 4ac. And then I'm still dividing by 2a. And then recall that minus square root of minus 1 is the new number that we introduced called i, complex i. And so now we have an expression that has almost all real numbers in it except for that one i. And so I'm going to split up the denominator here. And you can see now that we have a real part here and an imaginary part here. And I'm going to rename these alpha plus minus beta times i, where alpha is equal to minus b over 2a, and beta is equal to square root of 4ac minus b squared divided by 2a. OK, so um, from now on, we're just going to work with alpha plus and minus beta i, and just keep in the back of your mind that alpha and beta come from a, b, and c, and you can calculate them using these formulas here. So that tells us that our y of t is a strange creature now, because it's going to be c1 times e to the alpha plus beta i times t, plus c2 e to the alpha minus beta i times t. So we don't really want to work with complex numbers, though, because we posed a problem originally that was written all in terms of real values. And we are probably going to be interested in solving real applications that are all about um, measures of uh, distance or uh, um, magnetic field or chemical concentration. And these don't come in cl complex form. So how are we going to go back from getting these complex solutions back to real solutions? So the trick here is to realize that we can rewrite e to the alpha plus beta i times t as e to the alpha t times e to the i beta t. And that e to the alpha t is already real but it's the e to the i beta t that is still complex. So we're going to write that using Euler's formula as cosine of beta t plus i sine beta t. And similarly, we can write e to the alpha minus beta t, beta i, sorry, t. And that one's going to be equal to 
e to the alpha t. The difference is we're going to get a, a minus sign instead of wherever the beta appears. There's going to be a minus beta. But inside the cosine, the minus sign, cosine is an even function, so that, that minus sign doesn't make a difference. We can just drop it. And in the front of the sine function, it's an odd function, so it, that minus sign is going to come out in front. And when written this way, maybe it's a little bit more clear what we can do. So okay, now this is our y1 solution, and this is our y2 solution. Now remember, we talked about uh, linear equations, and one of the features of linear equations was that if y1 and y2 are solutions, y1 plus y2 is also a solution, and minus y2 would be a solution, so y1 minus y2 is yet another solution. And now we found these two solutions initially, and it was tempting to say, here's our general solution down here. That's, that's what we've always done. We found two solutions. We still have to check that these are independent, and I'll get to that later. I'll leave it really as an exercise, but I'll at least state the problem later. Um, but um, for now, I'm going to say pause on that. Let's not declare this as the general solution that we're really interested in, because it's more complicated than I want, or maybe I should say more complex than I want. And so I want to find two other solutions that are actually real. Um, and so if y1 plus y2 is always still going to be a solution, what is that going to give me? Well, you can see they're lined up very nicely. If I add up vertically here, I get y1 plus y2 is equal to e to the alpha t is a common factor. I can take it out from both of those. And then I get a cosine beta t plus a cosine beta t. So that's going to be 2 cosine beta t. And then the i sine beta t and minus sine beta t cancel each other. So I'm left with 2 e to the alpha t cosine beta t. Now that 2 in front doesn't matter so much because we're going to use this y1 plus y2 as part of our general solution. And this 2 will be sitting right next to a c1. So we can forget about that if we want. Or we can say let's divide through by or multiply through by a half because multiplying a solution by a constant also gives us a solution. And now we see that I'll call it z1 is equal to y1 plus y2 divided by 2 is a nice clean expression that is free of complex numbers. So we now have gone from two complex solutions to a single real solution, which is great. Now we just need a second one, and we're going to get that using a similar trick and I'm just going to write it down, but if you were to try doing, oops, no, if you were to try just doing z1 minus z2, sorry, uh, <laughs> let's go back here, z2 defined as y1 minus y2, and you would find an extra 2 times i in there, and you'll see where this comes out. I just want to set it up at the beginning here so it's clear what we're, what we're using and why that may not be obvious yet, but I think it will be when you see what happens. So now we're going to take... Uh, the first one up here, this guy, and subtract this one. So this time, the cosines are going to cancel each other, and I'll be left with e to the alpha t times, and now I get 2i times sine beta t. And now I divide that by 2i, and you can see that I get out of this e to the alpha t sine beta t. So all I'm using here is the fact that I found two solutions that were unfortunately complex. But because I have, a, a, this is a linear equation, linear homogeneous equation, I get superposition. I can sum up two solutions and they'll still form a solution. And I can also multiply a solution by a constant. So here I have the sum of two solutions divided by a constant or multiplied by a half. And that means this will still be a solution. And you can plug that in and check, but I mean, we, we're kind of in a mess of abstract letters here. So it's kind of hard to actually do that, but it is possible. And then for Z2, so it's a little bit less clear why I was allowed to subtract two. But if you think about subtracting, subtracting Y1 minus Y2 is really like taking y2 and multiplying it by a constant minus 1, so that will be a solution, and then adding to that another solution, y1. So constant times solution is solution, and then add to that another solution, and you get a solution still. 
and then to multiply that whole thing by 1 over 2i, and yet again, the whole, that whole thing will also be a solution. So we now have two solutions that are purely real. So my general solution, instead of this one here, which was good but uh, unnecessarily complicated, we can write it down in a slightly different way. We can write y of t is equal to c1 times e. Oh, actually, I'm going to factor out the e to the alpha t. So we get e to the alpha t times c1 cosine beta t plus c2 sine beta t. Okay, so um, the last thing I want to do here is just remind you that we can't just assume that this is a solution. We have to calculate the Ronskian, and I'm going to leave that to you as an exercise, but if we take Z1 and Z2 and plug it into our Ronskian formula, we have to be able to show that this gives us something that is non-zero. And when you do that, um, you'll find that it does work out very nicely. In fact, it's, I think it's something like e to the alpha t with maybe a factor in front. Okay, but I'll let you do that as a, a practice in calculating Ronskians and determining independence of solutions.